one of the dangers of being a churchgoer is we think we go two or three times a month or once a month, a couple times a year, and that's all we need. We get into the mindset that, oh, I know all that. I'll get to it when I get to it. Well, that's one of the benefits of going into Lent and changing up the liturgy a little bit to write one, different language, different responses, and I'm sure nobody got tripped up on anything. And as we look at the Bible passages assigned for this morning, we see the story from Genesis, and we see the gospel lesson. Ah, we know that. We know the story. Well, there is always more to learn, and that's one of the things that keeps me energized as I study Scripture. And I want to share with you some things that I've learned recently. And some of the stuff that you hear from me in this little message, you'll, you'll have heard it before, and you go, oh, God. Are you going to talk about Genesis again, Father Kirk? Can't you give up talking about Genesis for Lent? Well, no, I can't. Um, just a wonderful, deep passage, and I hope to open your eyes to it a little bit, because, again, sometimes we think we know what the story's telling us, and then we read it again with a little bit different language, and we go, huh, how about that? Okay, so from Genesis chapter 2 and 3 is what we have here. We're going to dig into even the parts that the lectionary decided they wanted to leave out. I don't know why, uh, but they did. They are just trying to keep things short, I suppose. But verse 25 of chapter 2, if you want to look on page 2 or 3 of your pew Bibles, holding that up to verse 1 of chapter 3, the last verse of the chapter says this, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And then the first verse of chapter 3 says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And this is where reading in the English puts us at a great disadvantage. No, Jesus did not speak English. He was not white. He was Jewish, brown-skinned. This was all in Hebrew originally. Still is, actually. And I like to read rabbis who study these things. And one of those rabbis I read is David Foreman, whose translation of this story has opened up a whole new world for me. Because there is more than one way to translate the Hebrew word rendered crafty. The Hebrew word arum, transliterated A-R-U-M, well, it's in this passage more than once, but it's not translated into English as crafty. And yes, arum does mean crafty, but it has at least one other meaning as well. Foreman translates arum from Hebrew as follows. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more naked than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. So the serpent is the animal most like the human being, but the serpent is still not human. The serpent is subhuman. Great, Father Kurt, why is this important? Well, here's what we know about the serpent, apart from the fact that he is more naked, and we'll take it on more, more vulnerable, less inhibited, more passionate than any creature God has ever made. We know that when the serpent is punished by God, The serpent is condemned to crawl on his belly for the rest of his days, which leads to Jewish midrash, which is artistic license, allegory to help find the profound truths 
of biblical stories, the Midrash speculates that the serpent, as initially created by God, stood on two legs, just like we do. The priest I worked for right out of seminary once chastised me for speculating that the serpent once stood on two legs. He accused me of making light of the Genesis story. He wanted me to be more serious. But there's a lot of theological work that revolves around the serpent, which is why it initially stood on two legs and then had to crawl on the belly for the rest of its existence. There's a reason behind that. And we'll get to that in a moment. But why was the serpent even created in the first place? I hear that question a lot. And I don't know for sure, but I wonder, and this is one of those new things I learned recently, I wonder if the existence of the serpent has anything to do with the ancient Jewish teaching that, follow me on this, there's an ancient Jewish teaching which says God created 974 generations before Adam and Eve. Now these people supposedly had the same physical and mental capabilities as humans today, but what they lacked was the divine soul that made them human beings. Adam was supposedly the first actual spiritual being, according to this tradition. And so if you've ever wondered why so many people suddenly appear in the book of Genesis, well, that tradition may provide an answer. But back to why the serpent exists at all. God created all of the animals in an attempt to find a suitable helper for Adam. Remember, it was not good for the human to be alone. And when no suitable helper was found among all the animals that God created, God took a rib, or more accurately translated, God took a side from Adam and created the woman. Now, in Hebrew, that first human being was both male and female, And then when the woman was created, then we had male and female separate. We'll deal with that another time. Then there's another Jewish tradition that says the serpent was jealous that he was not chosen as the suitable helper for the first human. After all, he was more naked, more passionate, more vulnerable, less inhibited than any of the other creatures, but being more wasn't enough, which enraged the serpent. And the line of thought is that the serpent would kill Adam, marry Eve, and rule the Garden of Eden. Great. Useless trivia, Father Kurt. What does this mean? What is the point of the Jewish allegory, and why is it essential to our understanding of what it means to be a human being created in the image and likeness of God? We find a clue in the words the serpent uses to tempt the woman, tricking her and Adam into eating the forbidden fruit. One theory as to why the serpent does this is because he was jealous that he, as an animal, was not as dignified a creature in God's eyes as the humans. So the serpent tricks the humans into thinking they should not be satisfied with their status as humans, that they should instead become like God. That's the alleged benefit of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that humanity would become like God. And there's more we could say about all this, and there's a lot more nuance to communicate than our time in this setting allows. But God tells Adam, who then apparently tells Eve, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because that would bring separation and death into the world. And one key to understanding the story, according to Rabbi Foreman, is how the serpent begins his conversation with the woman. In our Bibles, it says, did God really say? 
Foreman translates the phrase as, well, even if God said, just another sidebar, here's something else lost in translation. In Hebrew, up to this point in the story, the Hebrew word used for God conveys the understanding that God is loving. But the serpent uses a different word for God which connotes not love, but only power. Anyhow, even if God said, because the serpent is more naked, more vulnerable, less inhibited than all the other animals, we understand that the serpent acts strictly on instinct and passion and not on intellect, discernment, or rational thought. And that's why the serpent's first words to Eve essentially communicate It doesn't matter what God says. Go ahead and eat the forbidden fruit because it looks great. This is precisely why the serpent is not a suitable helper for Adam. The serpent is not created by God to listen to God's voice, to communicate with God through the intellect. The serpent couldn't care less about what God has to say. The serpent is a cold-blooded reptile who, when he sees something, views that object either as food to be consumed, a threat to be destroyed, or both. Yeah, that's what serpents are like. So we must ask, what is the difference between being a serpent and a human being? Now, if we look closely, we'll notice that nowhere in this Genesis passage is the serpent referred to as the devil or Satan. But the theology is clear. As we heard in this morning's gospel passage where Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness after being baptized, the fundamental temptation of the devil is for humans to engage in subhuman behavior to live our lives not consistent with the dignity which God has bestowed on us. The temptation is, in effect, to be less than human, to be serpent-like. As we reflect on politics, the business world, the institutional church, and other areas of of our lives, when we watch the news, we ask the question, What is the difference between a serpent and a human being? Who is acting more like a serpent than a human being? Like the serpent, the first humans were naked before God. They were vulnerable. They were uninhibited. They were passionate. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But unlike the serpent... The first humans were created in the image and likeness of God, which means that to be fully human, we must listen to God's voice. We need to use the intelligence God has given us to properly guide our passions, to use our creative energies not for serpent-like subhuman selfish goals, but to welcome into our midst the kind of world that God desires and not let our natural appetites devolve into commodifying God's good creation simply to satisfy ourselves through instant gratification. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit,